chapter 12, the last paragraph, beginning in verse number 49. Luke chapter number 12, beginning in verse 49, I entitled, Missed Opportunities. Missed Opportunities. I, how many of you have ever had somebody tell you, this is a ground floor opportunity? Am I the only one? Man, they come to you and they say, if you don't take advantage of this, you are going to miss a great opportunity. Well, there is an example in Scripture about a whole generation of people who missed a great opportunity. What is the most privileged generation in all of human history? And we think of ours. I mean, with the technology that we have today, the, for example, just uh, what's going on in the world. You know, and uh, we, we know almost instantaneously that there's an earthquake in, in Italy. And, and we know immediately some kind of uh, death count or something that's taken place. I mean, with our cell phones, with the 24-hour news media, I mean, anymore, when they run out of things to talk about, they start talking about themselves, right? And they start, I remember I was watching this particular news clip, and the uh, people, that I guess, that they wanted to interview didn't show up or they couldn't get them. And so the news babe, you know, she ends up interviewing the cameraman. And I'm sitting there going, well, what does he know about it, you know? But, you know, in a 24-hour news cycle, that's what happens. Missed opportunity is the, the theme I want you to see in this particular passage. And when I read this, I want you to look for three warnings. Three warnings that Jesus gives concerning this idea of missed opportunity. Let me set this up a little bit that who in the world... What generation is the most privileged? Well, it's not ours. I got thinking about this last week. The most privileged generation to ever live was the generation that got to see Jesus face to face. Got to listen to the Sermon on the Mount. The one that got to watch him walk on water. Which narrows this down to, to 12 guys that did everything with him for about three, three and a half. Wouldn't you say that they are the most privileged of all generation? That those who got to see and hear and watch Jesus. And then of all of that generation, 12 guys. One of them, his name's Judas, missed his opportunity for eternal salvation. And missed his opportunity to know in an intimate way above the superficial way of getting to see, hear, and, and watch, but to know in his heart that Jesus is God. Tragically, the whole nation of Israel forfeited the peace that God promised when they rejected Messiah. There could be no national or no worldwide peace until Messiah sets up his earthly kingdom and they turned aside. In the meantime, as a redemptive history unfolds, the gospel has offered a personal peace that comes from salvation only through faith in Jesus. And countless individuals have missed that opportunity to know what it's like to be able to walk into the throne room of God have missed their opportunity to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, to know that he does walk with me and talk with me along life's way. There's no hope for peace without Christ. And there's no hope for peace in this world without Christ. And there's no hope for an individual without Christ. And yet... There are those that have turned aside. I want you to look this morning as I read this, as I said, three warnings from Jesus' own words concerning a missed opportunity. Luke 12, starting in verse number 49. I have come to bring fire on the earth. Anyone have a red letter Bible? Those are in red, aren't they? Jesus speaking. I have come to bring fire on the earth, continuing in red, and how I wish it were already kindled. Oh my. But I have a baptism to undergo, 
and how distressed I am until it's completed. A little hint into the mind and heart of Christ. Do you think that I came to bring peace on the earth? No. I tell you, but the vision. Is this still in red? Oh, it's still Jesus speaking. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against the son, son against the father, mother against the daughter, the daughter against her mother, mother mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. In In other words, it's going to be a mess. And there is going to be a clash. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud, crowd, I want to make sure you got that right. He didn't say to the cloud. He said to the crowd. When you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain. And it does. And when you see this uh, south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot. And it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearances of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourself what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled to him on the way. Or he may drag you off to the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison and there I tell you you will not get out until you've paid every last penny I wanted you to see three little warnings from Jesus that shows that you've missed an opportunity and the first of which is somewhat, wow, did I, did I hear that right? And who is speaking when I, when I hear these words from Jesus concerning the coming of judgment? And at this particular point, he warns us about the missed opportunity of having eternal consequences. You see, the good news causes a division amongst people. I remember growing up, there was an evangelist. His name was Bob Harrington. He was a Southern Baptist evangelist in Louisiana. And Bob Harrington eventually ended up uh, debating Madeline Murray O'Hara concerning God and and God's existence. And, And it's kind of unfortunate he got known for that over what I'm about to tell you. He was known for this statement. There are two kinds of people in this world. And those of you who have been around me a little bit know that I have quoted him over and over and over again. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are the lost, and there are the saved. Only two, because at the end of this life, there is only one of two places that your eternal soul will end up. Either heaven in bliss with God, or in hell eternally separated from God. There are only two kinds of people in this world. Those that accept the good news, embrace the good news, and have taken Christ as their Savior, and have said, yes, He is the eternal Son of God. Or, there are those who have rejected. And there is eternal consequences to that decision. Jesus says, I have come. And again, it gives us this idea of his coming. We talked about this a little bit last week, that the coming of Christ is actually divided into three separate... The first was called the Advent, and we talk about the baby in the manger and at Christmas time. Let me hurry through this. A couple of you need to nod. The second is the rapture of the church, and the third is the second coming when he physically comes here to this earth. In John chapter number 5, Jesus says, I have come... In my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you receive him. And there's this like tilt. I mean, there's this 
contradiction and and sense. In John 6, Jesus says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who has sent me. And there's this idea that he's on a mission. There's a purpose. He didn't just, okay, the year zero, Jesus shows up. I mean, is there a year zero, by the way? Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, Jesus is here on this earth. And, you know, what happens? There's a plan. There's a purpose. In 19.10 of Luke, he's going to say, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And in this passage, Jesus reveals, I have a mission. I have a purpose. And my purpose here is to draw judgment, to cast fire, to cause a division. Every time in Scripture that this idea of fire, it, it, everybody understood. I mean, there was no one that was sitting there listening to Jesus that would question or draw some other conclusion, but that fire is the judgment of God. I mean, it only takes one time for you to hear the story of Lot and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah to realize God and judgment and fire are of the same. But the idea that Messiah was going to bring judgment was a foreign concept. And if there was an idea, yeah, when Messiah comes, there's going to be a dividing, or there's going to be a setting aside, or there's going to be some kind of judgment made, it's going to be on those Gentiles. It certainly won't involve us chosen. Jesus says... The judgment is upon you. And the division is going to be amongst you. When Jesus says, oh, I wish it was already kindled, he's indicating that that judgment's yet to take place, isn't it? It's not now. I wish it was already. Well, if it was already now, then I don't have to wish it's happened. But he gives you the idea. This judgment is out here in the future. Eventually, the Holy Spirit is going to give Peter some words. He's going to say it this way. The elements, we know that as the atomic structure, is going to melt away, Peter says, in a fervent fire or heat. And this world and everything in it is going to be consumed and purified And remade by God. Yet to take place. There's another thing that Jesus said in this passage that uh, gives us a kind of an insight. And he he talks about a baptism. He even says the word baptism here. Baptism always refers to an immersion. Whether we're talking about a physical water baptism or whether we're talking about being totally involved in something. It's an immersion, a baptism. And here, Jesus says, it's not yet taken place. But I wish it was already over. And he says something else. He says, how distressed I am until it's accomplished. We know from these that Jesus is speaking of his own death. The cross that is out here in the future. And prior to this, and even a little bit after if you miss this point, you'll think that Jesus never thought about his death until the Last Supper. Or that he was never distressed concerning the cross and dying until Gethsemane. But Jesus knew. He knew from the time he was born, I believe, throughout his entire life that my mission, my purpose is to come as a perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty for other people's sin so that if they believe they can have heaven as their home. We sung a song. He paid a debt he didn't know. Oh, that's true. But think about living, knowing that that is your purpose, the dying for others.
Now, despite his warning, you would have thought, I mean, Jesus started talking about fire coming down from God. I mean, I'm starting to ask some questions, aren't you? I mean, he's talking about my eternal soul and judgment. I'm starting to, you know, hey, God, you know, let's get this squared away. Or, hey, Jesus, give me some more information. Or how can I avoid How can I avoid it? Wouldn't it be logical? But just like many of us, it kind of goes, and it's gone. They missed it. And they missed their opportunity. They failed to take, are you ready for this terrible word? In this day we live in, this is a cuss word. Just like I say in my family, the word can't is a four-letter word that no one's allowed to use in my presence. I can't do something. I can't find it. Come up with another way to say it, but don't say that in front of me. Right? This is a modern-day cuss word. You ready? They failed to take responsibility for their own actions. They failed to consider the ramifications of rejecting And they failed to understand that eternal consequences are at stake. They failed to seek God. While it could be found. And they attempted to live life in a vacuum. Without God. You know what the one word is that is defined as without God. You know what that one word is that means without God? It's a four-letter word. And it's also in Scripture, Matthew, defined as a cuss word. One that is, better be careful if you use this word. Do you know what the word is? Fool. For the fool has said in his heart, King James refers to, the fool has said in his heart, no to God. But the literal translation of that verse is the fool says no God. And here they missed the opportunity while Jesus warned of judgment. Somebody comes up to you and says if you don't take that fence down I'm going to burn your house down. Sounds pretty radical doesn't it? Well wouldn't you at least say Why do I need to take the fence down? Or why does the fence offend you so bad? Why are you going to do this to me in my house? Wouldn't you at least say that as a rational person? In this case, he says, I'm bringing judgment. And you're going to be lost. And instead of saying anything, they just let it go by. The second one's found in verse number 51 through 53. The second what? The second warning. The second warning that Jesus gives that that judgment is going to fall, that that you have an opportunity to avoid this. 51 to 53, he starts talking about right here and right now. And he says, I have come to cause a division, and the division is going to be in the family, and the father is going to be against the son, the son's against the father. Do you remember that? Mother again. And And the... The fact that Jesus tries to illustrate this point that conflict takes place because of me. Now in different parts of the world, it's still this way. Maybe even here and now in a lesser degree that if you join that church or if you say that your baptism as a baby isn't uh, sufficient... Or if um, you say that Jesus is God, that your family is going to put you out. I know in places in the world, and we've shown it, that if you were baptized as a result of your profession of faith, I mean, they beat the tar out of you to the point of death. And, and reservingly, we've shown some of these examples. But in recent days, I've heard situations something like this. Um, yeah. I didn't get baptized because of my family. I said, really, why? Well, my, my family believes that when I got baptized when I was 
you know, 8, 10, 12 days old, whatever it was, that that was the covering of my sin. And, and they said that if I get baptized again, I'm turning away from that, and they wouldn't have anything to do with me. I couldn't go to their house on Christmas because they go to church, at their church at Christmas, and if I do And the conflict that takes place. I remember when I got saved, I came home. My, my mother went to church occasionally. Prior to me getting married, I could probably count the times on one hand that my dad went to church. But I remember coming home from church and telling my mom that, that I asked Jesus to come into my heart and life. And she looked at me and she says, was it really that good? And I realized immediately that she didn't get it. She wasn't sharing in the same excitement that I was and that knowing that heaven was my home and that Jesus was my Savior. I remember later on, as a teenager, saying something at the dinner table about the fact that Jesus was coming back. And I, I remember my dad saying, they've been talking about that all my life. And they'll be talking about it all of your life. And it still isn't going to happen. And I realized at that moment... They didn't share in the excitement that I had concerning Jesus as my Savior and heaven as my home. I remember only a half a dozen times that we ever sat at the dinner table growing up. One particular Thanksgiving, my brother invited his fiance to share Thanksgiving with us and she grew up Catholic and she grew up praying before every meal. Now, Catholicism and praying before a meal has nothing to do with one another. I understand that. But they did. And I remember before the meal that my sister-in-law, Janet, looked over to my little sister, I call her Yvonne, and said, would you like to pray? And started to show my little sister how to pray. And my dad saying, Janet, we love you as our own daughter, but you leave your religion at the door when you walk into my house. And I remembered then, you keep your mouth shut concerning anything about the Bible and anything about God and my house. If you want to live here. I'm not saying that they would put me out. I didn't give them a chance. I learned from a couple examples to shut up. Just be still. I don't know where you are in your Christian walk. I don't know where where your heart is at all. But I know this as a fact, that when you ask Jesus into your heart and life, there's a change that takes place. And I know for a fact that there's a division that takes place amongst you and those that don't know the Lord. And some of it is your family, and some of it is your friends, and some of it might be a husband or wife. Jesus talks about that division as a warning. A warning of judgment to come. I thought that in my thinking, the perfect illustration of something that is yet to come is something that is here and now. In my little logic brain, if you want to prove, you know, that, that the sun's going to come up in the morning, you point to the fact that the sun came up today and yesterday, and the day before, and the day before, and you, and you use that as an illustration, and people do that to this day. It's kind of a, a logical argument. And the most logical thing that I could point to is conflict. Conflict here and now amongst people who know and don't know Jesus Christ. But despite the warning... They missed the opportunity. Even with the most obvious illustration of family conflict, didn't seize the moment. They yielded to their negative side in which um, is part of our old nature. And rather than seeing the obvious, the strife of self and sin... They rejected him. 
In verse number 54 through the end of this passage, there's a last. Two analogies. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling Jesus right here trying to get this point across. That you're missing the opportunity to receive me as Messiah. And how can I define it for you? How can I make it more plain for you? As he comes up with, with examples. And the first one he says, if you see a cloud coming up over the Mediterranean, you say, it's going to rain. The last couple of days, you see these great old big black clouds forming over south, the southeastern part, and you, you know that it's blowing this way. You get the idea, hey, it might rain. In their case, they say, I feel this hot wind blowing from the west, and, and the desert is out west, and you feel this hot wind blowing, and, and we surmise by that, that it's going to be pretty warm today. And Jesus says, you know, you've got the discernment here to figure out what's taking place here and now with this world and the things around it. And yet you, dis you, you fail to discern the moment in which you're in. And they failed to recognize the time. It's short, folks. And let's say that we take on my dad's argument. I've been talking about this for a long time, Don. It ain't happened yet. It ain't going to happen. Yesterday, I was 50. Gary, yesterday, was 39. Today, Lynn is 39. Yesterday, she was 21. See how I worked that in? Today, she is 39. Yesterday, she was 21. I visited in a family's home and I said, who are these pictures of? Oh, well, that's me. And you say, wow. It was just the other day. My point. Phil. Amen. See how I worked that in? <laughs> you don't do this naturally. I mean, it takes a lot of practice. Okay, here we go. Ready? My point. And time short. Jesus is true. Judgment is coming. Opportunity lies before you. And you have to make the decision. By Jesus' obedience and our confession. Did you hear that? Not Jay, me. I did that. By Jesus' obedience... And our confession, eternal consequences take place. Our transgressions are put under the blood of Christ. And God's demands for ramification of sin is taken care of. And our eternal destiny changes because of Jesus' obedience and our confession. I said, by the blood he washed away my sins at the cross. He took away the curse of my fallen nature in his death, burial, and resurrection. And his Holy Spirit has sanctified me so that I can live for all of eternity with God himself. confidently I can stand here and say seek the Lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near because he really did pay a debt that he didn't know and you owe a debt that you cannot pay 
Pray with me.